This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customer surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. As if the McCrispy couldn't get any better, Bacon and Ranch just entered the chat. The Bacon Ranch McCrispy. Available at participating McDonald's for a limited time. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. This podcast contains explicit language. If you want to know how explicit, keep listening. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, Slate's national editor, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of April 10th, 2023. On this week's show, ESPN's Kevin Pelton will join us to talk about what went wrong for the Dallas Mavericks and to preview the NBA postseason. Slate's Jim Newell will also be here to discuss John Rahm's win at the Masters and the fruitless quest by the Live Golf crew to bring a green jacket to Saudi Arabia. Finally, we'll speak with LJ Rader, who pairs photos and fine art on the Twitter and Instagram accounts, Art But Make It Sports. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of The Queen and the host of the podcast One Year. Also in D.C. is Stefan Fatsis. He's the author of the books Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside. Hello, Stefan. Hi, Josh. Joel Anderson, still hard at work on Slow Burn Season 8, Becoming Justice Thomas, a topic that I understand was in the news last week. Um, someone who is here, I guess not someone, something that is here, Stefan, is a new remixed Hang Up and Listen theme song. As our in-house, as our in-house jazz critic, I'm eager to hear your thoughts. <laughs> I like it. Puts me in a sort of mellow mood. It's got a nice sort of calming vibe to get into the show. What about you? Yeah, I feel like I'm at the blue note, certainly. Uh, you know, the one thing that I am sure about is that people hate new things. And so if uh, you hate the remixed, revamped, hang up and listen theme song, then it's just because you haven't yet loved it. You're going to love it. Mm-hmm. You're just not quite there yet. And we wanted to thank uh, Mary Jacob, Slate's technical director, for uh, reworking the theme song for us, which we do love. Thank you, Merit. In our Slate Plus segment, Kevin Pelton of ESPN is going to stick around and talk about Bronny James, the as yet uncommitted high school star with a famous dad. Um, Kevin just saw him at uh, a USA versus the World basketball showcase over the weekend, and he'll tell us what he saw. To hear that, you need to be a Slate Plus member. You get bonus segments on this and other Slate shows. You get to listen to this show and others ad-free, and you get to support us, which we love and appreciate. Slate.com slash hangup plus to sign up. That's slate.com slash hangup plus. The NBA season truly began with the Warriors' Draymond Green punching his teammate Jordan Poole in practice, and it kind of ended, or at least the regular season did, on Sunday with the Timberwolves' Rudy Gobert punching his teammate Kyle Anderson during a mid-game huddle, a game in which the Wolves' Jaden McDaniels also punched a wall, ending his season with a broken hand. And also, for what it's worth, the Wolves won that game on Sunday while the Warriors locked up the number six seed in the West, avoiding the play-in tournament. Joining us now to talk about the regular season that just ended and the postseason that's about to begin is ESPN's Kevin Pelton. And Kevin, as someone who doesn't understand what causation means, I'm talking about myself, I think it seems pretty clear that punching teammates means guaranteed success in today's NBA. 
I mean, for a while with the Warriors, you might might have questioned it because uh, they they were not performing at the same level as when they won the championship last year. But uh, they seem to have stabilized things late in the regular season. And and in the Timberwolves case, I think the the causation is much more direct. They were behind at the time of that huddle incident between Gobert and Anderson, which is why there was the sort of frustration there was. And then kind of immediately went on a run and then a bigger run out of halftime after uh, after apparently there there had been another uh, flare up in the locker room that caused Gobert to get sent home. Uh, well, hopefully they will figure out new ways to fight each other before uh, Tuesday when they're playing the Lakers in the 7-8 the game in the Western Conference. Um, but let's actually start, and forgive me for, for this, but uh, with a team that went down without a fight this year. Uh, the Dallas Mavericks made the Western Conference Finals last season. They have one of the league's best players in Luka Doncic. They acquired Kyrie Irving, who actually played well and hasn't said anything anti-Semitic in months. And yet they were so bad, 7-25 and 25 over the last two months, including just 5-11 and 11 when Luka and Kyrie played together, that the organization chose to lose on purpose on Friday when they still technically had a chance to make the play-in tournament. So, Kevin, how did we get here and what did you think of the Mavericks' choice to lose their way into the draft lottery? So their fight was with the referees, I suppose, and and they had that uh, protest denied. It was one of the many steps that took us from the Mavs being in the Western Conference Finals last year to being out of the play-in tournament by choice this year. And, you know, the, a lot goes into it, including the Kristaps Porzingis trade, because the biggest reason that they chose to lose at the end of the season was they owe a top 10 protected pick to the New York to the Knicks to complete that Porzingis trade and losing helped ensure that they would finish with one of the 10 worst records in the league and therefore not need to move up in the lottery to keep that pick as opposed to you know just sending New York a, a late lottery pick for you know a trade that already before that was a tremendous disappointment for Dallas and you know as you mentioned, Kyrie has not been the problem since he went to Dallas. I, I think it's more, number one, what his trade exposed in terms of the lack of playmaking depth that the Mavericks had after losing Jalen Brunson to the Knicks, which is why they needed Kyrie in the first place. But it kind of was too little too late. Luka Doncic has looked really worn down late in the season after he had to log heavy minutes and just this extreme playmaking load, unlike almost anything we've seen in NBA history up until that trade. And then the other element of, a, of it was they gave up their best perimeter defender, Dorian Finney-Smith, to Brooklyn to get Kyrie. This was already not a particularly you know good defensive team, which was a difference from last year when Jason Kidd had them defending at a really high level in his first season as head coach. And that was the issue the last couple of months when Kyrie and, and Luka were both in the lineup. They scored a lot of points, but they were giving up even more at the other end. Uh, there was also you know some slight issues in terms of integration. It was a bit your turn, my turn in late game situations. And those two elements put them in a position where the best they could have done in the play-in was be the 10th seed, not have home court in either of those potential games. And and, you know, given that that limited upside, that's, I think, and then the downside of losing the draft pick, that's why they made the choice they did. Is that justifiable, though, Kevin? I mean, this is a team that could have made the playoffs. The fans presumably would have liked to have watched their team play in the playoffs or the play-in tournament uh, on television, even if they were on the road. Um, and it feels like a sort of watershed for the NBA. I mean, this wasn't just sort of casually tanking or resting players to save them for the playoffs or to bench players when you're out of the playoffs. This is a team that could have made the playoffs deciding for the sake of a draft pick to not try at all. And the sort of the manner in which they did it was kind of weird. I mean, they announced on Friday that Kyrie wouldn't play and then Luca would play because it was Slovenia night. So he needed to play at least a little bit. Um, and they've been trying up till now. And then this pivot is what seems sort of suspicious. And the NBA has said they're going to They also sad guys at halftime who were playing right. well in the game. <laughs> right. Right. Which, as you sort of alluded to, is not unprecedented. We saw, you know, some, some similar things from the Portland Trailblazers in their pursuit of getting all the way down to the, the fifth highest odds going into the lottery. But as you said, that was after they had functionally been eliminated, even from play in contention, they weren't officially out, but their odds were remote. And yeah, I mean, I, 
I, I'm not sure how fans in Dallas think about it. It is true that the worst tanking we tend to see is in situations like this where teams owe a protected pick going into the lottery. Uh, it made me think of the Golden State Warriors at the very early stages of this dynastic run for them. One of the decisions they made at the end of the season was they owed a protected pick uh, and to try to get high enough to ensure they would keep it. You know, they 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 went through, you know, a couple weeks stretch of really extreme, you know, sitting their best guys before it became even as commonplace as it is now, including a rookie Clay Thompson at the end of the season because he had become too good even to continue playing. And that ended up netting them Harrison Barnes, who, uh, you know, was certainly a part of their their first championship team and then the team that won 73 games. So, you know, that's kind of the long term element of it, I think. And I think a lot of fans within the league, this is part of the challenge for the NBA, a lot of fans within the league are actually happier for their team to pursue the draft pick because, you know, they're invested inherently for the long term, whereas, you know, players and coaches won't necessarily be around to reap those benefits. Well, the NBA, I think, has said that it's going to look into what the Mavericks did, which the NBA, I suppose, has to do and has to say. Um, this seems like it would be an incredibly hard thing to legislate. And it also feels like the Mavericks, both kind of in, you know, talk circles today and potentially if the NBA decides to do something, would be punished for actually having spent the entire season trying to make the postseason and then deciding at the very, very end to make a decision over the last two games, maybe even just of that that one game, that, you know, they'd made this big effort, it didn't work out, and we're just... Um, you know, accepted their fate. Whereas teams like the Utah Jazz were doing incredibly well at the beginning of the season, traded away a bunch of guys um, and missed the playoffs. The Pacers um, kind of fell off the pace, did something similar. You mentioned Portland. And then you have teams like, whether it's Houston, San Antonio, and Detroit, that don't try the entire season. And there's no discussion about them getting punished for that. So it just seems to me like, you know, maybe there there's some, you know, m- misplacement of of blame uh, on the Mavericks here. I mean, I think, you know, if you were to describe the NBA's approach to it, it's always kind of like, you can do this to a point, but don't embarrass us, basically. And the Philadelphia 76ers under Sam Hinkie reached that point, which is, you know, why the the NBA may or may not have had a hand in, in Brian Colangelo coming in uh, in Philadelphia eventually to replace Sam Hankey with Jerry Colangelo being pr- involved previously in as, as an advisor. And then I think this is the example of that for all the reasons we talked about at the start, because, you know, part of the idea here was, you know, when they changed the lottery odds and flattened them several years ago in response to what the Sixers did, they made it much more attractive to kind of tank your way to the middle, which is why, you know, Portland... Indiana teams like that made the choices they made. But the idea was, okay, we'll avoid this being too big of a problem by also giving this carrot of the play in tournament for teams that otherwise, you know, the Mavericks would probably, I think, have been eliminated from the chance of getting the eighth seed in the old format by this point in the season, but we're still alive for that play in tournament. And yeah, it's the, as you said at the start, it's the fact that they chose this over the chance at still making the playoffs through the play on tournament that I think made it so egregious uh, is to whether they'll get punished. I think it really comes down to like, are there specific texts that they can find saying, you know, don't play this guy, you know, the, you know, we need to try to lose this game. We'll, we'll see kind of how well the Mavericks covered their tracks, so to speak, that that paper trail probably doesn't exist to the same degree to a team that is doing this as kind of a long-term organizational decision where it's more, let's just not get played is good enough of capable of getting us to the playoffs in the first place as opposed to sitting those who are it seems like the i mean mark cuban is not very good at keeping his mouth shut on this and they <laughs> even made it clear that you know Doncic made it clear that he wanted to play and it was a decision by the owner and the general manager and jason kidd also in his news conference seemed to be saying that hey not my choice here yeah everyone kind of wants to distance themselves from this at least publicly so the western conference playoffs I guess we're calling it the postseason. The playoffs have not begun yet. Seem more wide open um, than any year in recent memory. Um, the Nuggets being the number one seed. Um, then you've got the Grizzlies who've been playing really well, but um, after John Morant's uh, suspension and Brandon Clark's injury, Stephen Adams' injury, that there's just a bunch of question marks there. You have the Kings who've been really consistent all year long, but they're the Kings. Um, and they have a really bad defense along with the best offense in the NBA. 
And then you have the number four seed, the Suns, who seem like they're everyone's favorite after getting Kevin Durant, but they've barely played together. Does that seem like a fair kind of summation? I guess I did. I guess I didn't talk about the the Nuggets. There are questions about Jokic's defense, and they've never, um, you know, been able to put it all together, even with Jokic winning MVP the previous two seasons. Yeah, I mean, I I think 2021 was pretty comparable in terms of we had two kind of unexpected teams in Utah. And at that point, Phoenix was the unexpected team near the top of the Western Conference because they had been in the lottery the previous year before adding Chris Paul. And it's the combination of those teams at the top, as you talked about the questions about them, and then also kind of the experience. And we've seen this before of the teams in the bottom half of the Western Conference playoff bracket. So that's the Clippers who made the Western Conference finals two years ago with Kawhi Leonard going down during the middle of that postseason run, and they were my pick to win the West at the start of the season, a lot of others as well. You have the defending champion Warriors in the sixth spot going up against these playoff and experienced Kings. It's an all-time mismatch in terms of playoff experience where it's the the lower seeded team that has the huge edge, not like the eighth seed that, you know, is the inexperienced team. And then the Lakers, you know, who have been a better team after trading for D'Angelo Russell and Malik Beasley and Jared Vanderbilt at the trade deadline from the aforementioned Jazz. Uh, Most of those players coming there from there, D'Angelo Russell coming from the Timberwolves. And with LeBron James and Anthony Davis, they are, you know, won the championship in 2021 and 2020, I should say, three years ago in the bubble. So you have this unusual situation where you're used to all the teams that have had recent major playoff success are at the top of the standings. And in this year's West, they tend to be at the bottom of the playoff standings. The Lakers and LeBron and the Warriors and Steph are going to suck up a lot of the air in the conversation for, for the start of the playoffs, at least. And we haven't even mentioned the Eastern Conference. And the tables obviously are flipped here this year where the strongest teams in the NBA are in the East after a very, very long time of the strongest teams in the NBA being in the West. Um is a lot of this Western Conference jockeying a formality once you get to the Bucks and the other top teams in the East? I definitely think that Milwaukee and Boston are in kind of in a class of their own. And then I think you'd put Philadelphia in the same class as some of these Western Conference teams. So yeah, the, the overwhelming odds are whoever comes out of the East is going to be a heavy favorite in the NBA Finals. But you know, if you get there, there's always the possibility that You know, upsets happen and also injuries happen that could even out a series like this. And I think, you know, Phoenix and Golden State are probably the two teams that in particular we could find out over the course of this playoff run that they actually are in that top class in the NBA. In the Suns case, as was mentioned, it's just we have not seen this group together with Kevin Durant, who who barely played due to injuries after they added him at the deadline. You know, I I still think the, the fact that they don't have a proven kind of fifth player to close games uh the the spot that it's going to be potentially josh akogi who's had a really nice season for them but was out of the rotation in minnesota last year uh tory craig who, who's been a defensive specialist for them terrence ross who they picked up at the uh, as a buyout player after the trade deadline you know one of those guys is going to have to like step forward as the consistent third option for them in that spot or maybe tj warren who is also part of the durant trade uh for them to get to that level and in the warriors case it's just sort of everything coming back together and them looking like the Warriors again. They also have not had their group for a long period of time. Andrew Wiggins was away for the te- from the team for months for personal reasons, came back during the final week, but they chose not to play him the last couple games of the regular season as he was ramping back up towards the playoffs. And their starting lineup has still been as strong as any unit in the league. It's basically any time at least one of those guys has been off the, be- off the court that they have not been the same team at all, but their bench looks much different than it did at the start of the season. They added Gary Payton the second, who was part of last year's championship run at the trade deadline. And, and he just returned to the lineup uh, within the last few weeks after dealing with an injury post trade. Uh, and then, you know, at the start of the season, they were trying to play a lot of these young players. James Wiseman, who is now in Detroit, was part of that trade. Uh, Moses Moody, who has been on the fringes of the rotation. Jonathan Kaminga is kind of the one young guy who has stepped forward and solidified a rotation spot. And then the other key player for them is Jordan Poole, who was really good for them in last year's playoffs when Steph Curry was coming back from an injury, but hasn't played at that level this year. I've just been stealing myself for ever since the trade deadline. 
for the Lakers to win the West. I think I know it's going to happen. <laughs> I'm convinced that it's going to happen. Um, hopefully, Kevin, you can explain to me why it's not going to happen. But um, before we get to that, I think for me, the big picture of this season and for the, um, you know, we'll see what happens in the playoffs, is that it feels to me like the top players in the league have never played less. And yet, and some of that is due to injury. Some of it is allegedly to prevent injury. But it seems like as we get into the playoffs, you know, Paul George isn't there. Zion isn't isn't there. Um, I feel like the playoffs are going to be decided by injuries going in and injuries that are suffered within the postseason. Like, I feel like you probably want to draw the Suns or maybe any number of other teams earlier in the playoffs because what are the chances that whether it's Kevin Durant, who's suffered a bunch of injuries this year, whether it's Chris Paul, who always gets hurt in the playoffs, that they're actually going to make it through three or into a fourth series healthy. Um, the Lakers have had a, a huge number of injuries, obviously. James Harden and uh, always is hurt and seems to be hurt now. Joel Embiid always gets hurt in the playoffs. Like Whether it's the start of the regular season or the start of the playoffs, as people that love basketball and watch basketball, we like to imagine like, oh, what's it going to be like when, you know, this big three faces off against, and it just never works out that way. Yeah. I mean, the, the 2021 playoffs, again, a good, good example of that. Uh, Brooklyn is just rolling with that big three at that point of Durant, Irving, and Harden. And then Irving and Harden both get injured over the course of their series against Milwaukee. Harden returns, but is playing at like 70 percent if that and it's really kind of durant just trying to lead the way on his own and they end up losing that one in seven uh you could look at last year's milwaukee boston series where chris middleton was out milwaukee ends up losing that one in seven is the defending champs and boston goes on to make the finals and you know throughout nba history it's probably been more the case than we remember in our heads that injuries have decided a lot of this series i did some research a few years back several years back that you know i think there was only one or two championship teams had had a player miss more than a regular player had missed more than one or two games in the playoffs due to injuries but the number of them is increasing in recent years and so therefore they're they're having bigger effect uh yeah in phoenix's case it's kind of an interesting question because on the one hand if you get them early you know that they're going in healthy but they haven't necessarily developed chemistry you you get them potentially later like the warriors now couldn't potentially face them until the western conference finals you know the downside of that is they could be clicking by that point based on what they've learned over the first couple of rounds but the upside would be you know perhaps they are not at full strength by that point didn't even mention Julius Randle in the mix, which I think is going to impact the entire Eastern Conference outcome. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a seismic impact throughout the East from that 4-5 matchup. Kevin Pelton writes about the NBA for ESPN. Kevin, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Up next, Slate's Jim Newell on John Rahm's big Masters victory. When you're drafting your fantasy team, do you ever wish you could handpick the best stars for your business team? If you're building your talent roster, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like matching assessments and virtual interviews. Hate waiting? Indeed's U.S. data shows more than 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash hangup to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash hangup, Indeed.com slash hangup. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. There was a moment during the back nine of the Masters on Sunday when the leaderboard suddenly included three of the Saudi money grabbers from Live Golf. 
taciturn and efficient Brooks Kepka, Phil Mickelson, who vaulted into second place with a seven under par 65, and unlikable Patrick Reed, who was wearing a hideous pink shirt. Ugh, who was I supposed to root for now? The answer was the winner, John Rahm, the pear-shaped Spaniard, who started the day four strokes back and finished it four strokes up. Rom seems pretty charming. He carried his baby off the 18th green, love a baby, and he thanked his Spanish golf forebears, Seve Ballesteros, Jose Maria Olafabel, and Sergio Garcia. A couple of years ago, he quoted Ted Lasso's Be a Goldfish line. Slate's senior special golf correspondent, Jim Newell, is with us now. Welcome back, Jim. Hi. John Rahm won the U.S. Open in 2021 and now the Masters and has been number one for a total of like 60 weeks. He also feels like a throwback to a time when golfers didn't lift weights. We like him, right? We do like him. I don't think he's um, – he doesn't play a, a crazy style, you know, like other golfers people fell in love with, like Phil Mickelson or Jordan Spieth, where it's just constant thrill ride. He's just kind of a machine. He's good at everything doesn't like stray too far off the beaten path. Um, he gets pretty fiery sometimes. He has a temper issue, um, but he seems like a good guy. So yeah, it, it, the story of this Masters is kind of best player in the world wins the Masters. It was pretty straightforward. Jim will recall that uh, I noted before the Masters that everyone was already handing John Rahm the trophy. I just wanted to can I get credit you for did, that? Jim? But I, I think you said that about like uh, Larry Mize the year before too. So <laughs> you know, okay, you got this one. Um, but this was not uh, unexpected. Um, but the craziest thing that I read about on Sunday was that he's the first European ever to have won both the Masters and the U.S. Open. That seems like it can't be true. I was shocked should we go by back, that. I should was... we go back and check that? Yeah, I heard that. I heard that too, and I guess John Rahm, they told John Rahm, and he had no idea about that either. <laughs> and John Rahm, like, kind of studies all this stuff, like, knows, like, you know, the, the history of Spanish golfer success and European golfer success, but he was, like, completely stunned when they brought it up to him. I don't know, it's kind of a coincidence almost. Rahm is uh, one of the players who decided not to abandon the PGA Tour, um, and this Masters was kind of billed as a showdown between the guys who stayed and the guys who left. And despite the fact that Brooks Kepka blew the lead on Sunday, um, it seemed like the live guys like surprise did surprisingly well. Was that your takeaway, Jim? Yeah, it was it was a pretty good week for the live guys. I think three of the top six were live guys and they only had 18 people there. And 12 of them made the cut. And 12 of them made the cut. I mean, it was kind of... I think a lot of the PGA Tour guys were wondering, you know, they haven't really played real serious competitive golf in a while. They kind of do these exhibition things where they're getting a guaranteed check anyway. They're not going to really uh, be sharp when they get to a place like Augusta. But they were. Um, I, it could have been a real, like, over-the-top celebration for Liv if Brooks Kepka had actually uh, finished the job and won. There was – Greg Norman was saying earlier in the week the the – CEO of Liv that they were going to like rush the 18th green if a Liv player won. When you ask the Liv players themselves, they were like, "Yeah, we're not doing that." But that would have <laughs> been a pretty huge deal for Liv to show, you know, that they had now the the last two major winners. So I think uh, the PJ Tour is kind of breathing a sigh of relief that that Rom was able to pull it off. But yeah, I, I think that that dispels the theory that Liv guys won't be able to show up at these majors. Well, these live guys are professional golfers after all, and they still, I assume, practice a lot, even though all the money is guaranteed and there are no I cuts. I don't know if they do practice a lot. <laughs> Brooks famously doesn't practice. He hates golf. <laughs> or maybe that's why they went to live. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah. I, the, the most remarkable performance was Mickelson and you know easy to hate Phil these days and it sounded like the reception he got at Augusta was pretty chilly at their renowned the uh, champions dinner or whatever the hell they call it where they're all where they all wear their green jackets and eat whatever food the last winner wants to serve um, and on the course the first couple days when the weather wasn't too shitty um, not that many people were following him around and it was pretty subdued but boy, 65 on Sunday at 52 years old is 
you have to at least say, nice job, dude. I mean, it was incredible to watch. And as much as like I was disgusted by some of the things Phil did last year, um, I like couldn't help but get excited watching him. Um, it was really interesting when he made that putt in 18. Like he got a decent reception, but if you looked at the crowds, there were a lot of people not getting up, a lot of people just doing a polite applause. If he had done something like that a couple of years ago before this all broke out, I mean, people would have been losing their minds. The Phil thing, it, it just kind of, it makes me sad because he is like, he's like an Arnold Palmer level figure in the sport. I mean, he is one of the most exciting players ever at 52, making a vintage run and getting a second place finish in the Masters. And it just seemed kind of muted. It also felt like throughout the week, you know, I because Augusta has so much control over what CBS puts on, they were not showing a lot of Phil Mickelson. I mean, he was kind of, he had a bad third round, but he was in the thick of it pretty much for most of the tournament. And I felt like it, it felt like you didn't see any shots of him until it was unavoidable and they kind of had to show him. So um, I don't know. Yeah, I give him credit. That was really impressive. And uh, even, even if he's made some terrible choices the last couple of years, um, it was really fun to watch. Well, maybe there's a connection here because um, Augusta, it's the only course that uh, hosts a major championship every single year. Um, it's a course that certain players have, um, you know, do well at consistently. Fred Couples, famously being one of them, makes the cut, the oldest player ever to make the cut in his uh, early 60s now. And so maybe do you think that there's some kind of explanation there of how the a lot of these live players were able to do well? Because even if they haven't practiced, even if their games aren't particularly on point, They've all played Augusta um, a whole bunch of times and know the course, and there's some sort of like muscle memory there. Yeah, the Masters is really strange like that, where you can get people who have a you know across four decades or so all show up and be somewhat competitive with each other. You know, like I think it was a couple of years ago, Bernard Longer, who was in his early 60s, came in like fifth place or something, or like he was actually contending for a while, and that's because there's so much. So much that goes into playing Augusta's knowing all the different breaks and everything. Um, so I, actually, I think in 1998, Jack Nicklaus yeah. and Tiger Woods both were in the top 10. Yeah, in the same yeah, tournament. no, Jack Nicklaus was like one off the lead when he was 58 years old. So it is something that can happen. I mean, usually it's not sustainable like that. But definitely, like Patrick Reed also was in the, uh, the top five, and he's a former winner there. So he knows the course really well. So it is something, you know, I don't know if... Again, I should never say never, but I don't know if when you go to a U.S. Open or a, a PJ Championship that Phil or some of these other guys might be sharp enough to come onto a new course like that that's just in brutal conditions and, and really make a run for it. But yeah, there is something to Augusta, which I think makes it cool, where just generations can kind of compete against each other. And with Phil, Jim... Do you think that his performance and the performance of the other live golfers will do anything to soften the relationship between these, you know, this league and the PGA Tour? Or is this just a one-off and, you know, Phil's going to get a chilly reception wherever he goes? I mean, I, I mentioned that Champions Dinner, and I saw this quote in a, in a piece over the weekend. Tommy Aaron said, I wished him good luck, but I couldn't believe how quiet he was. Phil took a very low profile. He didn't say a word. Fuzzy Zeller said, Phil sat near the end of the table and kept to himself. He didn't speak at all. He was more animated by the end, after the tournament, after he shot that 65 on Sunday. Um, but does this have any bigger meaning, do you think, in, 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 the, in the relationship between these two entities? I don't know. I think... People are coming into it thinking, you know, oh my God, are there going to be fist fights that break out between some of these guys who have been trash talking each other? And it that seemed been like, cool. yeah, that would have been cool. It didn't seem like it happened, but partially because people kept their distance from each other. But if you, even if you look at the photo of the championship dinner, you see like all the live guys on one end of the photo and like Tiger and Fred Couples and a bunch who have big problems with him on the other side. So I think it was just, it was probably awkward throughout. I, I mean, one of the things that, um, also makes me sad about Phil is like, he just doesn't really say a whole lot anymore. He's not freewheeling anymore. For obvious reasons, being freewheeling got him in a lot of trouble and like made him a villain pretty much. So I feel like there's got to be some way for someone who's that much of a legend to get his way back into 
the good graces of golf fans to where he was, but it's probably going to require some kind of change on his part. And he hasn't really, I don't know what that path back is from live, which he basically organized himself. Well, I mean, we focus a lot on the relationships that live golf severed, but what about the fact that it brought Brooks Kepka and Bryson DeChambeau together? They were the huge <laughs> rivals who hated each other on the PGA tour. And now they're, uh, they're pals. I was thinking about that. Yeah. That was like two years ago that that was the biggest story, like how these two were just <laughs> trash talking each other. And now it seems like, I don't know, it seems like a million generations ago. And Kepka has said that if he hadn't been hurt when all of the live money was getting tossed at everyone, that it would have at least made his decision much harder. Um, and now that he seems to be back healthy and playing better again, you know, th there has been speculation that he would be one of the guys that would be interested in going back to the PGA Tour. Like, it, it doesn't seem like the status quo, just because nobody watches Liv, who knows how long the Saudi Public Investment Fund is going to want to bankroll it. Um, and there are going to be, certainly at some point, players who want back so long as they don't have to pay back any of the money. Yeah, I thought that was one of the most interesting things this weekend was Brooks saying, yeah, it, you know, it would have made his choice harder if he hadn't been injured. And also he said, I miss competing with Rory and Scotty Scheffler and all these guys. So I think he's clearly showing, you know, they say, but I'm, I'm perfectly happy with where I went. <laughs> But but then they say, and I, I think he's showing a little bit of buyer's remorse. So I'd be interested to see if he wanted to come back, if they made kind of a pathway, because that would be a huge blow to live, which is already, you know, no one's watching it. it it's only there just because they have such a long leash, you know, in terms of the, the bankrolling. But as you said, that's not going to last forever. Eventually, they're going to see a path to making some money on this thing. And, and you know... I was also wondering, though, if Brooks won and Liv got exactly what they had wanted, or even now where they got so many of their players in the top 10, you know, who is that going to make want to watch Liv golf more? Like, and that's just kind of a leap that, that I don't really understand. You know, even if Brooks had won, are people going to turn on the, the CW on weekends to watch him play like, you know, Orlando National or whatever course they are? I don't think so. It's just, I think the path has to be finding a way to, to fuse these two leagues back together because it was so great seeing everyone all together. I mean, you mentioned buyer's remorse. I mean, Kepka had won four majors. I mean, he had to feel like, I need this on a regular basis, or maybe not. I mean, I don't know. The guy, and you know, as you've said, he's he was always kind of a loner anyway on the tour, and if he can get it up for the majors and do as well as he did here, maybe it doesn't matter. But these guys are all competitive in the end. And if they feel ostracized at a place where they want to feel accepted and compete at this level, you have to think that there's going to be some second guessing and maybe attempts to get out of contracts. Um, let's talk about um, Tiger Woods because we have to talk about Tiger Woods. We're contractually obligated by Jim, are, Jim, and Jim's contract with the show. I, I wonder if it made you particularly sad to see Tiger have to withdraw um, on, uh, was it Saturday that he withdrew or Sunday? I guess it was Sunday, Sunday that he withdrew, like with the you know potential of having to play 30 holes um, and having kind of fallen way, way, way off the pace after making the cut. Did it make you even more sad seeing Phil compete um, at age 52 and say, let me get this quote in front of me. At 52, no physical injuries, no physical problems. Being able to swing the cl a club the way I want to, to do things in the game that not many people have had a chance to do later in life, while Tiger is basically like hobbling around with like with one leg. I mean, it makes me sad just in general that he can't really play much golf anymore, that that happened, that that, that last car accident happened. So yeah, this is a continuation. When he withdrew, though, I was like, you did that about 12 hours too late. Like he, I was very happy because they withdrew because he was miserable and he was really at risk of injuring himself further. When I, like going into the week, I thought, okay, if you're not in contention, but you make the cut, you should just drop out because you could see the temperature was going to be in the 40s and raining, which is miserable for him. Um, but I guess he tried to gut it out, you know, that pouring rain on Saturday. And that's where the really bad videos of him limping showed up. Um, so I am glad he didn't try to muscle through that Sunday because I think that could have, 
you know, he only has so many spots. He has, you know, there's three more majors. Maybe he can play two of them. But if he really injures himself, I mean, that that could have been it. it it's just so – for him now, like, if it had been 80 degrees every day at Augusta or something, that would have been fine. But when he saw – like, as soon as that forecast became 50 degrees on Saturday, it's like – don't stick around to try and get 41st place instead of, you know, 48th place or whatever. It does seem like his only pa- pathway to quasi success at this point, Stefan, would be a master's in good weather. Yeah. I mean, it's the walking that is the problem. It doesn't seem like it's the swinging and the putting quite as much. Um, Wood said that the reason he couldn't continue was because of plantar fasciitis. Um on the bottom of his foot. It wasn't, I mean, it's connected, of course, but it wasn't something very specific to his knee or his shin or the surgeries. Um, it was this other thing that is debilitating for anybody that gets it. Um, but yeah, I think the conditions have to be absolutely ideal, right, Jim? I mean, in order for him to just walk 72 holes, it has to be, you know, and it can't be too hilly and it can't be too cold. It's got to be just right for Tiger to make it through an entire tournament. Pretty much. And, you know, Augusta, even if, you know, with all his course knowledge and even if you get good weather, that's still going to be an extremely difficult walk. So that is a counter to that. I think his yeah. best chances are British Opens because just they're not too long necessarily and they can dry out. So he can, you know, he doesn't have to keep up with, length with everyone um and he's still got his creativity so i think that works to his favor but if he goes to british open and it's 50 degrees which it often is at those tournaments then it's another problem so i mean i don't i don't know that what kind of hope there is for any success for him in these you know in these next few years but i think he's obviously he'll never give up as long as he has the opportunity to move so I don't know, maybe one of these days the, the conditions will be uh, perfect for him. It was really, really, really hard to watch him stagger like a very old person uh, in the rain on Saturday afternoon. There is a tour where it's only 54 holes and there's no cuts. There's also a tour for players over the age of 50, so he's almost there. Which he said this week that he was interested in doing. So, uh, wow. and then the he'll be able to... The senior tour, not, not, not live, let's be clear. No, yeah, the senior tour. And he'll be able to ride a cart. So uh, right. I think we just have to wait a few years and then he can um, win 10 senior tour events a year. Jim Newell writes about golf, but mostly politics for Slate. Jim, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Coming up next, we'll talk to LJ Raider about his social media accounts, Art But Make It Sports. time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. You work hard for your money, so you should be able to spend it on the things you actually want. With Apple Card, you can kiss fees goodbye. There aren't and never will be any annual foreign transaction late or over the limit fees, not even hidden ones. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, late or missed payments will result in additional interest accumulating toward your balance. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.49% to 26.49%, based on credit worthiness. Rates as of March 1st, 2023. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. You work hard for your money, so you should be able to spend it on the things you actually want. With Apple Card, you can kiss fees goodbye. There aren't and never will be any annual foreign transaction late or over the limit fees, not even hidden ones. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, late or missed payments will result in additional interest accumulating toward your balance. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.49% to 26.49% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of March 1st, 2023. 
Back in January, the Lakers' LeBron James had a chance to beat the Celtics at the buzzer. His layup attempt went awry, though, likely because LeBron got hacked by Jason Tatum on his way to the basket. But the refs didn't call anything, and LeBron lost his mind. So did his then-teammate Patrick Beverly, who went onto the court with a photographer's camera to show referee Eric Lewis a still image of the missed foul call. Innovative. Pat Bev got a technical, the Lakers lost, and later that same night, the Twitter and Instagram account Art But Make It Sports immortalized the moment. The post that night is a pairing of two images. You've got Pat Bev and the camera at the top, and a 17th century painting by Peter Paul Rubens at the bottom. The painting is titled The Presentation of Her Portrait to Henry IV. There's a king instead of a referee, which, you know, basically the same thing. And instead of an excitable point guard, there's a winged cherub pointing at a still image. The framing is absolutely perfect. All we need now is Pat Bev showing this post to NBA Commissioner Adam Silver in the hopes of getting his technical rescinded. Joining us now is LJ Rader. He is the man behind this artistry and so much more that you've hopefully seen on the Art But Make It Sports accounts. LJ, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, let's start with this uh, Pat Bev, Peter Paul Rubens pairing as a case study. That non-foul call and the response to it was a huge story that night. How did you hear about it and what did you do when you saw Pat Bev holding that camera? Uh, I had been to uh, to Paris and and to the Louvre and scouting uh, trip. Took, <laughs> scouting trip, exactly. Uh, I call it meme meme fuel, uh, and got hundreds and hundreds of, of photos. And that one in particular, I remember seeing and saying to myself, you know, I hope this comes up one day. Um, and hope I can use this one day. And when that Pat Pat Bev uh, moment happened, I was like, all right, this let me let me look back. But I think this is a good one. <laughs> So you're going to museums, and I've read about this, and taking photographs of art hanging on the walls and putting it in your phone, and you're able to then recall the individual images that match up with something you've seen, a photograph, or something that a follower has sent you? Yeah, and I feel bad because, like, before all of this, I'd go to images, and anytime I'd see somebody taking a photo of the artwork, I'd be like, oh, you know, <laughs> why don't you sit there and appreciate it? And now all I do is I go from, and I, I tend to, so what I do, I take, you know, go take a picture, move to, and like pretty fast through museums. And then afterwards, uh, sort of look through everything that I've taken, and, and that's sort of how I end up appreciating the art itself. But yeah, I I take lots of of photos uh, at all the museums I go to, and then they all kind of live in uh, in a folder, and I tend to have a pretty good recall of uh, you know what I've seen and and where it is in that folder because the folder itself is organized by um, by date, and it tends to to chunk by museum slash galleries. Uh, and so I know sort of, oh, you know, the loop. Stefan, the, the greats all have this kind of recall, Stefan. You know, Seriously. If you talk to LeBron I mean, after a game, it's like, yeah, and then that time J.R. Smith, you know, threw the ball out of bounds, and then there was a layup, and, you know, that's it's just what you come to expect <laughs> from, from people so, at the so, highest echelons. So, LJ, which comes first typically for you? Is it seeing an image, a f- sports image, and going, oh, my God, I remember this, you know, Matisse or Magritte or Diebenkorn, or is it (laughs) I've got this piece of art in my mind and I'm looking for the sports scene to match it? Yeah, so previously, like when I first started the account, it was very much going to museums, taking pictures uh, of artwork and then captioning them instead of doing kind of the mashups. And that's why I called the account art but make it sports because it very much started with the art and I would just kind of pretend that it was a a, a sports scene in, in terms of the caption that I gave it and then over time what started to resonate were the ma- uh, the mashups you know the side by sides uh, and in this case it's it's much more sports but make it art because a lot of the images I tend to use are ones like with Pat Bev for example right that happened in the moment and if you can make something in the moment sort of injected into the the conversation uh, those are the ones that that tend to pick up traction. So it's now the sports image comes first, but 
it is a recall of an art image or an, an artwork that I've seen before or like a, an artist style or a, sort of a, a theme in art history. So the Pat Bev one seems like, just as a connoisseur art term of the accounts, it seems like it might be a little bit unusual in that it's just so <laughs> kind of perfectly matches a a kind of painting by Rubens that's like not necessarily typical in terms of its framing or subject matter. But it seems like there are other sports images where just because of the way that the athlete is pointing his arms or the way that people are kind of next to each other, guarding each other or something like that. It just fits into like a maybe a fairly common mode of like representation in a religious painting or something like that. Um, is that a kind of fair, you know, dichotomy of the of the kind of, of images that you're looking at? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's part of, you know, what sort of resonates with people because you, you they tend to I think they tend to get this this hit of uh you know oh like I've seen that before uh, especially when it's with artwork that depicts things that people have seen before um I I think I I did one uh, this morning where uh, I had posted it before but I kind of sometimes go back to the the old one just cuz you know, tend to get a whole chunk of, of new followers that have never seen a lot of the older ones and it's you know the dead Christ supported by an angel it's like something that people have seen in museums, maybe not that specific artwork, um, but then when you pair it with a, a sports image, you're like, oh, like, I get it because I've seen that. Whereas with the Rubens, it's it's a fairly unique one, but it just matches so well that uh, you know people understand that too, visually. You know, I was, I was thinking about this in preparing to talk to you, and it does feel like it's just that art depicts who we are, um, and sports are also who we are. And the history of art is pretty ubiquitous in terms of depicting the human condition. I mean, every conceivable kind of scene and person and image and idea from the real world as depicted by artists ends up getting represented in sports. And the classical stuff is the most, of course, absurd to see. And one of my other favorites is from the Super Bowl a couple years ago when Bobby Wagner, the linebacker for the Rams, knocked over that protester and you found a, uh, a piece of art called The Rape of Tamar by Eustache Lesseur from 1640. And it's uncanny. I mean, down to the coloring where the, the idiot on the field was holding a like a smoke canister that was emitting pink smoke and the color at the top of the painting is also pink. I mean, do you have like a moment of, oh my God, when you see something like that, like this is just too crazy to be true? <laughs> I got lucky with that one in a way. That one's been sitting at the top of my phone for the longest time. I have seen that painting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. I live in New York uh, and uh, that painting at times is on view at the uh, the Met and I'd taken it, I think, years ago uh, and then... I guess have been. I think I'd used it for something else a long time ago. But when that that Bobby Wagner protester uh, uh, hit came up, uh, it was instantly. Oh, like I've seen I've seen that at the top of my phone for the longest time. So so there's um, also kind of abstract images which have their own delightful kind of tickling of our brains. You did one recently with. Shohei Otani in his red angels uniform bowing to uh, Ichiro, who's wearing a kind of Mariner's um, dark bluish green. And that's paired with these Ellsworth Kelly images of kind of a, just a red and blue line. So then kind of next to the Otani and Ichiro, they kind of like assume the sort of human form in a kind of uh, amusing way. What are you thinking about when you make those sort of mashups? Yeah, so that's one of the, uh, maybe one of the only ones I've ever taken a little bit of artistic liberty with, which is I took the images and put them on a different background and put them next to each other, where those two pieces from Ellsworth Kelly don't naturally sit next to each other. But I thought when I was doing it, part of Part of what would make it interesting is, is just doing it that way because uh, you have 
two figures like Otani and, and Ichiro, who I don't they're painted by the same artist in some sense, right? They are Japanese superstars coming to America and absolutely dominating, um, but they have their own unique styles. And yeah, I mean, I I knew when I saw Otani sort of doing that bow that uh, Ellsworth Kelly tends to have colorful or single monochromatic shapes that have bends to them sometimes and uh, ended up finding that the red one and then you know got lucky with the blue one that was a little bit slanted i was like what if i put these you know next to each other uh and then i i mean sounds I, like that uh, long explanation is just an excuse for cheating <laughs> <laughs> i did i did cheat uh i did put in the description that that i placed them next to each other so i explained my my cheating there but don't yeah. don't let this start a slippery slope <laughs> you know we don't we don't want you to be you know reversing the images and you know crop you know uh, let's, let's I, not let this start a trend <laughs> i do i do tend to take a little bit of of cropping liberties and and shaping liberties as well but i don't i don't change the artwork itself uh, ever um but yeah that i mean that one's fun uh, the the photographer uh that took that um i don't know if i'm gonna pronounce her last name right but uh lindsey wasson uh does great work and i i love using her her uh her photos so that's another thing stefan is that the um this account spotlights the great sports photography that it were just sort of inundated with i mean these people do amazing work and it's great and we take for granted yeah, exactly yeah i mean that's part of the, the fun of it for me is um you know i've got sports photographers that now send me photos that they take and say you know what can you what can you do with this and learning more about sort of their process and there is much artists in the sense of you know what i do is the the sort of you know van goghs of of the world that they're paired with and I think there is a, you know, a certain artistry that uh, these photographers use to to capture these these images. You know, I think uh, everyone saw the Ja Morant uh, overhead shot from from the other night from Joe Murphy, who sort of mastered the remote camera work of uh, taking those those overheads and turn that into his own kind of art form. So sort of finding out who the photographers are sometimes a lot of the the accounts and, and people will just tweet out the images and without any attribution and uh, I think it's pretty important if we're you know if the the account is called has art in the title uh, it's pretty important to to credit both the artist of the artwork and the artist of the the photo so I really liked another recent one that was not a photograph you took the win probability chart from the Furman, Virginia, NCAA men's basketball game and paired it up with a 1951 painting by Clifford Still. How did that come yeah. into your head? Like, how did you realize yeah. that there might be something here? So I'd been to the Clifford Still Museum and knew that his work tends to have ridges and, and sort of sharp angles and uh, tends to only pair a handful of colors that are juxtaposed across those angles. Um, so, and I had done a win probability one, I think it was the Northwestern Nebraska at the start of the season uh, when Nebraska completely uh, gave away the game uh, to put it, to put it nicely in the, in the second half um, and used a, a Clifford still for that. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the ones where it's like you see it and you see the the win probability sort of angle and angle up. It's like, all right, this is this could be one of paired with one of his works, and then it's like me looking through Clifford Still's works and saying, Okay, I don't know. And the, the colors match perfectly. They were the team yeah. colors. Clifford Still must have been a Furman fan. <laughs> he knew. He knew ahead of time. LJ, like who are your favorite artists and is the is the list of your favorite artists? Also, the list of artists that are easiest to match with sports photographs, or are there artists that you just absolutely love? And you're like, "Damn it, Jackson Pollock!" I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some artists that I've come to enjoy because of how easy they are to to match with the uh, with sports photographs. Uh, Rubens, who we previously talked about, uh, is definitely up there. His his work plays really well. And this is where I'm not classically trained in art history, so I, I mispronounce things potentially, but 
Giotto, uh, G I O T T O, um, from way back in the day. It's like John McEnroe trying to pronounce Sitsipa, yeah. Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the, his, his work, uh, plays really well. There was one with Justin Jefferson doing the gritty that paired with a figure in, I think his, his depiction of the lamentation. And that one always cracks me up just because the idea of somebody from, you know, the 1400s knowing what the gritty is, uh, and then it's sort of manifesting, uh, however many years later, uh, in a, in a sports, uh, a sports image is, uh, just makes me chuckle. So you had also asked what my, uh, Sort of favorite artists are not necessarily ones that are easy to pair with, but uh, I love Alice Neal. Uh, she tends to do more sort of figures and, and portraits, uh, which are a little bit harder just because there's not a ton of, of movement. And I don't really match on faces necessarily uh, as much as I do sort of scenes. Uh, Edward Hopper uh, is another one. Um, just saw his, uh, his exhibition at the Whitney. So got a lot of photos but i don't know how many of them i'll actually be able to use so you've never done a hopper um i think i did one there's one that's part of the whitney permanent collection of a guy wearing a hat and he looks just like your stereotypical sports journalist from back in the day and i think this is back when i was captioning versus doing the the image matchups and i think it said here's why i've joined the athletic Back when like people were joining the athletic and it just kind of looked like a, a sports journalist or your stereotypical from back in the day. LJ, uh, it's been a pleasure to get inside your bizarre minds, one which I uh, respect and appreciate. And I think uh, everyone who's listening to the show, I mean, podcasting is obviously the best medium to have a conversation about uh, pairing different images. So people should go uh, to the Instagram account, the Twitter account. We'll put links to all the stuff that we discussed in our show notes. Um, and you should go to the Art But Make It Sports accounts on Twitter and Instagram. LJ Raider, thank you so much for the work you do and for coming on the show. It was great talking with everybody. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Disney+. Plus. For the Bell family, basketball is everything. But can they navigate the game of life together? Based on Kwame Alexander's critically acclaimed best-selling novel and narrated by David Diggs, The Crossover, streaming now on Disney+. Plus. And now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, longtime sponsor of the show, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. Uh, we have talked at some length about the Masters, won by John Rahm over the weekends. Um, but the Masters also uh, made an appearance at a minor league baseball stadium on Saturday afternoon. Uh, the West Michigan Whitecaps are a single-A affiliate of the Detroit Tigers. Their announcers are Dan Hasty and Nathan Wrangler. And let's hear what they uh, provided to their listeners on Saturday. Hello, friends. A beautiful Saturday afternoon in Comstock Park. This is inning number seven. Still in the front nine, if you will. Your initial thoughts, Stefan. I love this guy already. That's my initial thought. Keep going. I want to hear more. Let's continue. Eric Pinales hails from San Cristobal. It's about 30 kilometers from Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Right now looking at a pitch from about 60 feet, 6 inches. <laughs> Do we take any points off for the fact that the music... That is being played. It's kind of like the interstitial music. It's not the music that would be playing in the background while doing play by play. No, we take are, no are we points adding off. points? We're adding points. We're adding points for the production value. All right. It brings us right to Augusta. He started with the Hello Friends, the Jim Nance signature. I, this is flawless. Is there more? There is more. No idea how that one stayed out. A 
has struggled a lot in 2022 with his control. A fine hit, deep to left center, <laughs> off the wall. Luke is done into second base. Exquisite. A one-out double here in the seventh. Did you hear what sounds like a, a golf clap in the background there? Adds to the verisimilitude. I also liked uh, Nathan Wrangler. After about a, a little more than a minute, the color guy finally chimes in. Well played. Well played, Nathan. Respecting the game. Sometimes silence is the best announcing. And finally. <laughs> Aren't you happy that doesn't sound like that every single day? <laughs> You're putting me to sleep. Felt like a lullaby. <laughs> I could have listened to another inning or two, to be honest. Look, sometimes we're not good evaluators of our own work. We need the outside world to tell us uh, what works and what doesn't. So, Dan Hasty, well played. Stefan, what is your Dan Hasty? As some listeners may recall, I grew up in Pelham, New York, a suburb just over the city line from the Bronx. When I was in high school, the New York Times described Pelham as a pocket of pre-war charm, its quaint homes and churches reminiscent of a bygone era. My parents bought our brick and stucco house at 915 Edgewood Avenue in 1955, three years after their first son was born, three months after their second, and eight years before their third, me. They paid $31,500. The house had two habitable floors, seven rooms on the first, four bedrooms and three baths on the second, plus an attic and a dank, unfinished basement where I played ping pong on a slanted floor and shot hockey pucks against the wall next to the boiler. Outside, in front, I simulated Yankees games, throwing a tennis ball or a Spaldine against the steps, trying to hit an edge when Thurman Munson or Bobby Mercer or one of my other favorite players was up, and make the ball fly over the bushes for a home run. Wiffle ball was in the back, drain pipe, left field foul pole, into the driveway, double, over the neighbor's fence, home run. My brother wrote, Stefan is a jerk on a beam in the garage that I couldn't reach. At some point, my mother told me our house was actually part of New York baseball history. She said it had been built by John McGraw, who managed the New York Giants for 31 seasons from 1902 to 1932. That was neat, a baseball Hall of Famer with a side gig as a contractor. But I didn't investigate until a few years ago when I was researching an afterball about an early 20th century Giants pitcher named Hooks Wiltsey and remembered my own connection to the era. It turned out that my mom had it wrong, or maybe I just misremembered. McGraw hadn't built my house, he'd lived in it. McGraw and his wife, Blanche, bought 915 Edgewood Avenue in the fall of 1920 and moved in the following summer. They would live in my house for the next 10 years. McGraw was the epitome of a manager of those times. Smart, shrewd, pugnacious, tough, and demanding with his players, the historian Charles C. Alexander wrote in his 1988 biography. McGraw got into countless arguments and was tossed from dozens of games. He hurled an endless stream of profanity at umpires and opponents. He got into fistfights with players and fans beneath and outside of stadiums. After one bar fight during Prohibition, McGraw was prosecuted for violating the Volstead Act, the federal law that prohibited the manufacture or possession of alcohol. A jury acquitted him in five minutes. McGraw owned pool halls, a racetrack, and a casino, and ran up gambling debts. He was business partners with Arnold Rothstein, the gambler connected to the 1919 Black Sox scandal. More than once, players on his Giants teams tried to fix games, and three Giants knew in advance about the Black Sox. McGraw professed innocence and was never implicated in any wrongdoing. On the field, McGraw was a brilliant strategist, a demanding leader, and a perceptive talent evaluator, except of Babe Ruth. If he plays every day, the bum will hit into 100 double plays before the season is over, McGraw said after Ruth arrived in New York. Off the field, McGraw was socially and financially generous with friends and strangers, and was lively company. And a lot of that company visited 915 Edgewood, a perpetual mecca for our ever-widening circle of friends, Blanche McGraw wrote in her memoir, The Real McGraw. 
The guest of honor at the McGraw's very first dinner party in my house in 1921 was the new commissioner of baseball, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who'd been hired in the wake of the Black Sox scandal and had just forced McGraw to sell his interests in a racetrack casino in Cuba. The ex-wife and children of Jim Thorpe, who had played for the Giants, were infested with fleas from the McGraw's Airedale, Truxton the Sixth, while sitting in what the McGraws called the Sun Parlor, and then the flea parlor, and what decades later we called the TV room. There are photos in Blanche's memoir and Alexander's biography of the McGraws sitting in wicker chairs in the TV room with Hall of Fame pitcher Christy Mathewson and his wife Jane. The vaudeville star and newspaper satirist Will Rogers was a regular visitor. Rogers said the chili made in my kitchen by McGraw's driver, Edward James, whom McGraw had brought home from a spring training in San Antonio as a teenager, was the best in the world. Blanche wrote, Usually Rogers would telephone from Dinty Moore's, a Broadway hangout, and ask me if Edward was there. I'd tell him yes, and that I'd order beans from the market right away. Will Rogers eating chili in my house is a pretty cool image. An even cooler one, Casey Stengel making bacon and eggs in my kitchen. In 1921, McGraw acquired the 30-year-old reserve outfielder from the Phillies. During the next three seasons, Alexander wrote, Stengel, then unmarried, spent much of his time at my house. Blanche reported that the two men would stay up all night talking baseball. Stengel didn't credit 915 Edgewood in his Hall of Fame induction speech in 1966, but he thanked McGraw for teaching him the art of managing. They spent most of the time in the kitchen, Blanche wrote, because it was nearer to the food. Casey liked to cook bacon and scrambled eggs, which he did two or three times a night, and John liked to eat them. In the morning, the McGraw's cook would open the food chest first thing, shake her head, and telephone Weissbecker's Market for supplies, muttering, the peas are gone again. How can that Mr. Stengel eat so many raw peas? I'm not entirely sure what to make of the fact that I grew up in the house where John McGraw taught Casey Stengel how to manage a baseball team. It's just a coincidence, after all, a twist of real estate fate in pre- and post-war America. But my childhood home is a field of dreams for me now. McGraw, the Sage of Pelham, a Times columnist dubbed him in 1927, climbing the side door steps after being driven home from the polo grounds. Stengel over the stove, in the kitchen, cooking eggs. Landis holding court in the living room about saving baseball. The gentlemanly Christy Mathewson, who gripped the imagination of a country that held a hundred million, Grantland Rice once wrote, telling dead ball era stories in the TV room not long before he would die of tuberculosis at just 45. Will Rogers cracking wise in the dining room, Giants owner Charles Stoneham, whose son would move the team west, and Frankie Frisch and Dave Bancroft and other future Hall of Famers, and Broadway stars and gamblers and restaurateurs and newsmen, long dead, reanimated a century later in my mind, making themselves at home at 915 Edgewood Avenue in Pelham, New York. Amazing. That was so good, Stefan. Um, how did you find the stuff out? You said you only started looking into it a couple of years ago. A few years ago, actually. I just never got around to finishing the research and to writing. I read the Alexander biography of McGraw, which was excellent. I looked at McGraw's own autobiography, biographies of Casey Stengel. But Blanche McGraw's memoir had the most detail about the house and the entertaining that they did there. I also visited Town Hall in Pelham and looked at property records. I found the record of sale for Blanche McGraw in 1930. The house was in her name. And the uh, five subsequent sales until my parents bought the house in 1955. I emailed with the town historian to check a little detail and with Charles Alexander, who urged me to write this, and uh, with MLB historian John Thorne, who wrote back, Ghosts walk on today's greens words in baseball as in no other sport. All that it takes to materialize one of them is an impending milestone record or an echo of a play not seen in 40 years. John McGraw is real. Casey Stengel is real. Aunt Minnie, 3,000 miles away, is not. Whoa. <laughs> Amazing email. I think a little sepia-toned baseball imagery is, uh, is in order here. Love it. Well... Congratulations to 
whoever's living in the house now that both John McGraw lived there and the author of Word Freak and A Few Seconds of Panic and Wild and Outside. Good point. When the McGraws sold the house in 1930, they moved to another house in Pelham. John was only in his late 50s, but he had several illnesses. And Blanche wrote, I thought this would reduce the temptation to bring home more people than he could comfortably entertain. What's the address of the McGraw's other house, just in case there are people listening? 620 Eli Avenue, E-L-Y. It's just a few (laughs) blocks away. It doesn't look much smaller than our house, actually. The McGraws lived there until John died of cancer in February 1934 at the age of 60. And he died in the same hospital where I was born almost three decades later. If you lived at 620 Eli Avenue, email us at hangup at slate.com. Or if you also lived at uh, 915 Edgewood Avenue in between the McGraws and the Fantasists, let us know. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. Listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup, and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And please subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zalmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.